Welcome back. Time for human change over time. If we get the work, there we are. So, in this one, we're looking at um, where we've come from, and particularly our own species, and and the discovery of some interesting um, new developments in our our genus Homo. Well, the extinct members of it, anyway. Um, so, without further ado, because it's quite a long slideshow, I hope we can get through it in one hit. Let's see how I go. We are primates. So originally we belonged to this group called primates, huge group of animals, really quite um, interesting group. And we apparently all come originally from this little tiny mouse-like shrew thing. Um, so what do we share? As a group, the primates share a grasping hand, that ability to grab things. We have bicuspid teeth, a short nose, well-developed eyes and brain. So we're highly visual animals. So primates like, they're all highly visual. We also then belong to a group within the primates known as the hominids, or the family hominidae. And this includes um, gorillas, orangutan, chimpanzee, and bonobos as the extant species. Uh, and unfortunately, the gorilla, orangutan, chimpanzee, and bonobo are all critically endangered, basically due to the actions of the other member of the family hominidae. What do we have in common? Well, no tail. Large body size, so these animals are much larger. Very complex cerebral cortex, so it's amazing brain capacity. And a very characteristic upper jaw and the frontal bones of the skull. So we've got some skulls, we'll look at our human skulls and chimpanzee skulls and things and compare those in class. And we, within that group, are hominins. So how are we different? Well, we walk fully upright. We have fewer teeth and they're smaller. Our faces are flat and lack those heavy brow ridges, well, in most people. Um, we have large cranial capacities, so that's pretty true of all the primates, but we have a particularly large cranial capacity, and one of the definitions of being a member of our, of our species, of our genus, sorry, is the cranial capacity. We make tools. Now, hominins do too, other animals do, but we actually are very, very sophisticated in our tool use. We use language because we actually have muscular structures which allow us to form sounds as i am doing for you now and art and we use that language and art to communicate really quite complex ideas <laughs> and the most um contentious is the idea of self-awareness and I, I don't know about you but i reckon that a bit of self-awareness goes on other animals too that's a, that's a more contentious one for me um, but that's on the list so just quickly with a classification we are of the super kingdom eukarya so we are made up of eukaryotic cells we belong to the kingdom animalia we are chordates, we have a knot of cord running down our spines. We belong to the class mammalia, so we are hairy. We have um, mammary glands and produce milk. We belong to the subclass theria, order primates, family hominidae, genus homo, and we are the extant species of our genus, the homo sapien. Just a little bit of background on you. Um, so, <clears throat> what evidence is there for this? Well, DNA sequences of our mitochondrial DNA in humans and apes have now been completed. And, and we've, we've actually sequenced um, the nuclear membrane of most of the um, hominins as well. And these sequences are so alike that it is con considered conclusive evidence that we all share a recent common ancestor. And our phylogenetic tree sees the orangutan diverge from a common ancestor first, the gorilla from a second common ancestor, and then the chimpanzees uh, diverge from us at a common ancestor, and chimpanzees and bonobos um, diverge again. So bonobos look a bit like chimpanzees anyway. Um, and the molecular and so the uh, nuclear and mitochondrial DNA is pretty much conclusive. So homonyms, a quick trip through the family album. Well, and of course this is all contentious because it's pretty hard to prove if fossil evidence is really poor. Um, a lot of DNA work's being done, but they reworks the most recent stuff. And again, if you've got poor fossil evidence, then it's pretty hard to, to do much with DNA as well. Remember, these are casts in most cases, so they don't contain DNA. Um, but essentially there's four of us, the four uh, genus of our group. The Salianthropus, which looked like they arose about six or seven million years ago, very ape-like. You can see that brow ridge there on that diagram, very ape-like in that sense. Bit of a sacral crest here for muscular attachment. Uh, shorter face, 
many more teeth than us. Um, so Australopithecus is probably the most significant member, and Lucy was an Australopithecine, Australopithecus afarensis, and she was a very important member of uh, this troop, and we've got her skull there if I have a look at later. These guys are fully bipedal, their knee joints have changed, they're walking upright, the foreign magnum is saying to work in position under the head, and I'll show you what that is. They have very human-like hands, but chimp-like brains, large face, but human-like teeth, so they're becoming human, well, we're saying to evolve. After Australopithecines, we see the Paranthropus. The Paranthropus um, were often called uh, Australopithecine robusta until they broke them. But as you can see, really strong jaw. These are big, robust animals. Massive sacral crest, something you find on a gorilla. That's where you attach muscles to attach that jaw. So really strong bite. Um, but we believe that they start to use tools. We find tools with these guys. Pretty simple ones, but we start to find tools. Um, and then, of course, there's us, Homo sapiens, or Homo genus. Uh, we have Rudolphensis, and I'm not too sure about Rudolphensis, but apparently there's, um, not Rudolph, sorry, there's another one I'm not too sure of. Rudolphensis is probably the earliest, and we find um, fossils at Olduvai Gorge and Lake Turkana, which are two really important locations in Central Africa. Um, and they're about 2.5 million years old, but with a small brain capacity. Homo habilis is generally considered next. Um, Again, still reasonably small brain capacity, but starts to make tools. Ergaster and Erectus are essentially the same thing. Um, Ergaster is more often used on African um, fossils, and Erectus for those that left Africa, and particularly uh, found in South Southeast Australia, Asia. They lack the larynx that would allow for speech in the older, especially the Ergaster. But they're certainly starting to use tools and, be, and are clearly very human like. Um, and then we have the more recent um, individuals. So, Hydrogentis is known from a single jawbone, and I'm a bit doubtful to be honest, but anyway, it's still listed. And Neanderthalensis is a species which lived extant with us in our early Homo sapiens. So, Homo sapiens and Neanderthalensis would have overlapped and would have come into contact quite regularly. There was a lot of conjecture about what happened to them and whether they disappeared to and whether there was any um, interbreeding. But DNA sequencing in recent years has shown that there is Neanderthal genetics in Homo sapiens. So we clearly interbred, um, which makes us pretty closely related species, doesn't it? And so if we interbred successfully, are in fact separate species, but let's not go there because those sort of things get really tricky when you start talking about humans. People don't like those conversations. And recently, oh, I didn't finish off the Denisovans. Uh, recently, we've had um, some new developments. We've found Floriensis, um, which is an incredibly small dwarf species of Homo, but it only became extinct about 18,000 years ago. So it was in Flores, an island off the coast of Indonesia, not far from the coast of Australia, when Aboriginal Australians were on the coast of Australia in the north. There's belief that it was they probably knew of them and the uh the traders through that blackened trait the blackens would have known of both groups and probably traded with both groups their small brain size had some people not wishing to include them in the homo genus but of course their small brain size is also related to the fact they are a dwarf species they live in really dense jungles a lot of work being done trying to work out where the hell they fit and some really interesting new studies in recent times homo sapiens the modern homeids Flat face, correct posture, big brain size, use of tools, use of language, use of fire. And then we've found some other things. We found the Denisovans, which for some reason I forgot to put the notes in. Uh, I must go back and fix that before I use it in class. The Denisovans were found in Siberia. And again, it's only a few bones. But we've been able to take genetics from those bones and discover that we contain Denisovan genes in Homo sapiens. So we can remember them too. They were extant when we first arose as sapiens. There's a group called the Red Deer Cave People, who are still, uh, we're not too sure what the hell they are yet. Um, they may be another species, they may in fact simply be Denisovans in China. We've now found um, two more species that were extant with Erectus and Sapiens in um, Africa, and the most recent one um, in Southern Africa. So a lot of new species putting a lot of pressure on where the hell all this fits together. 
And that's a really big question still, and people are still arguing about it and studying it and trying to make sense of it all. And it's interesting because it's, it's hard. When we start talking about our own species, um, being uh, objective becomes difficult for people. Because we developed this amazing, co amazing cognitive ability, we're able to develop speech by walking upright. We're able to free our hands to carry things and use tools. And so we see this interconnection between cultural evolution with our biological evolution and our technological evolution. So all of a sudden you see tools, so tools to cut things, you know, stones sharpened to cut, needles made from bones to sew things, throwing sticks, spears, boomerangs. They lead to you know uh, bigger spears and bows and arrows and all that sort of stuff. Fire, the ability to actually cook food was a big thing. But it also meant we could keep warm in harsher environments and stay longer in harsher environments and use fire to protect ourselves from predators. Um, shelter and clothing, we're actually able to make our own clothing. We're able to sew things together. We use the, the hides of animals we killed and make clothes. And we could shelter from, and make shelters to so keep ourselves warm and, you know, with the fire, keep ourselves warm inside our shelters and again, protect ourselves from being predated upon. We started using art to express ideas and express hunting plans and spiritual expression and all sorts of interesting things. And then we stopped being nomadic and we started seeing still and we became agriculturalists. Uh, um, we started planting crops and raising animals. Interesting, it came at a cost. By being nomadic and eating what we could find, we had a really broad, diverse feeding of animals and plant material, most of it full of bacteria. And we we're always wandering and collecting, so we're act, highly active and with a diverse diet. And apparently when we first became um, sedentary and started raising our own food, our diet reduced remarkably, our contact with bacteria reduced remarkably, and we became much less active. And we almost died as a cost of it because as we see now, that's not a good thing. Um, am I going to run out of time? Uh, actually, I'll stop because I'm going to run out of time.